hide your skin? If you can help heal your skin from within. With Dupixit, adults saw long-lasting, clearer skin and significantly less itch. Don't use if you're allergic to Dupixent. Serious allergic reactions can occur, including anaphylaxis, which is severe. Tell your doctor about new or worsening eye problems, such as eye pain or vision changes or a parasitic infection. If you take asthma medicines, don't change or stop them without talking to your doctor. Talk to your doctor about Dupixent. We're going to go into the boss woman's office. Do not really tell gotta... Vanessa. That's right. We're busting in the boss's office. Tomorrow, E.T. <laughs> gets an exclusive set tour of the NCIS Hawaii set. Plus, your wife, Vanessa Lachey, will oh, be here to yeah. guest calls. It's her turn. It's a little homecoming of sorts. Isn't it? It comes back it's a to big homecoming yeah. of sorts. We back can't to wait where it all to have started. Yeah. But we thank you for taking the time to help us My out pleasure. today. Be sure to tune into his show, Alter Ego, Wednesday nights on Fox. But before you go, you're going to experience a first here in Hawaii. Before. You're like, what is that? He's like, what's going on? Right. I thought the Happening now. It's election day. Voters head to the polls to cast their ballots for the special election for Texas House District 118. We're going to hear from both candidates at the polls and what's at stake tonight. And the deadline for vaccine mandates for government workers has ended or are in sight. Coming up, the tactics some have taken to fight those mandates. Next. Our next cold front will arrive tomorrow. Get ready for some big changes and some rain chances. I'm going to detail it all in just a bit. News at 5 starts right now. And we begin with breaking news on the COVID-19 vaccine front. An advisory panel to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention backing the Pfizer vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. It's the second advisory panel to endorse the vaccine. The Food and Drug Administration also giving the green light, but there's still one more step in the process. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky has the final say in this matter. That decision could happen, though, in just a matter of hours. Turnout for today's joint election, not exactly overwhelming. It has been slow so far, according to Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan. A constitutional amendments and school bond issues, no doubt important, but perhaps the biggest draw, the runoff for State Representative District 118. Voters are going to be deciding who fills the vacancy left by Leo Pacheco. Jesse DeGoyado caught up with both candidates after a chance encounter of the two at the same polling site. There they were, shaking hands and smiling. Democrat Frank Ramirez and Republican John Lujan, political opponents in a tight race to represent District 118. Earlier, Ramirez and his mother arrived at the Precinct 1 satellite office to cast their votes. The turnout at this Southside polling site, steady, and so far his campaign says their polls show he's ahead. I think the numbers are reflective of the work that we've been doing here in the community. Outside the Northeast Side Library, where voters waited their turn, Lujan was just as encouraged in his latest attempt to reclaim the same seat he won five years ago in another runoff. Um, there's a lot more enthusiasm, I think, in this race. Ramirez says he's not surprised by the Republican push in what has been a Democratic district. They're utilizing this race as a stepping stone to the rest of South Texas. While Lujan says he's aware of the national attention this race is getting. Donald Trump's not down here in our community. Joe Biden's not down here in our community. John Lujan is running for state representative for District 118. Even so, Ramita says his campaign is sending Republicans a message. Let them know. Democrats are here to stay. And this is a, a pure Democratic stronghold, and we need to keep it that way. Despite whatever greater significance the District 118 race may have, both candidates say, if elected, they'll be judged on what they actually do once they're in Austin. Coming up at 6, you'll hear what voters may think about the race. That's coming up at 6. We're live outside the Bear County Elections Office. Well, they'll start counting the votes once the polls close at 7 p.m. I'm Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Thank you very much, Jesse. The House District 118 race, not the only thing on the ballot today, though. There are eight constitutional amendments on that ballot as well that must be approved by voters before they become law. Three that apply to broader groups include Prop 3, which will ban all governmental entities in the state from limiting or prohibiting a religious service. This is something that we saw happening at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, Prop 6 will actually allow residents in nursing and assisted living facilities the right to designate an essential caregiver who could not be denied in-person visitation. 
Uh, this was also something we saw happen during the height of the pandemic. And there's also Prop 8, and Prop 8 would extend state tax exemptions for the spouses of military members who die due to any injuries sustained during their service, whether it is combat related or not. And for a full list of everything that is on today's ballot, you can head to KSAT.com. Don't forget, if you haven't voted yet, polls are open until 7 o'clock tonight. You can vote at any polling location nearest you. We're keeping track of tonight's results both online and on air. You can catch those tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Bringing you up to date on other news, new at 5, an Edgewood ISD police officer now indicted on federal wire fraud charges. Fernando Chancon Jr. arrested yesterday by the FBI. The charges from his tenure with the Maverick County Sheriff's Office. The 41-year-old accused of soliciting and accepting bribes of money and other things of value to remove pending tickets and arrest warrants against citizens. He faces two counts of wire fraud, which carries a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison on each count. In a statement, Edgewood, Edgewood ISD says, quote, an extensive background check was conducted and cleared for Mr. Fernando Chacon. EISD followed appropriate protocols per the outcome of that investigation conducted by the office of the FBI. He is no longer employed with the district, end quote. The San Antonio police investigating a shooting on the north side. They're looking for a woman they believe shot a man twice at the Gardenwood Apartments near the 1400 block of Gardena. It's not far from Vance Jackson and I-10. Investigators say that man was not being cooperative, but he did tell them he was doing maintenance on a car when the woman came up behind him and shot him once in the leg and then a second time in the abdomen. Police said the woman took off in a car. They aren't sure if she lived at the apartments or what her relation is to that victim. A man's okay after he was stabbed at a motel on the northeast side this morning. Right now, San Antonio police are trying to get to the bottom of why he was stabbed. Officers were called to the Travel Inn in the 5700 block of Industry Park around 10 this morning. That's near Riddiman and Loop 410. They said the man was stabbed there, but before they were able to speak with him, he ran to a nearby motel and locked himself in a room. He later ran back to the Travel Inn. The man told investigators he was stabbed during an argument with another man, but didn't say what that argument was about. And to an update now on that fatal drag racing event in Kerrville. Today, we're hearing from one of the surviving victims, Chance Jones, the father of six-year-old Daniel Trujillo Jones, who died in that crash, speaking out from his hospital bed. On the day, a lawsuit has been filed against both the sponsor of that event, Flying Diesel, and Michael Gonzalez, who was behind the wheel of the car that crashed. It's a family event, kids. There's, there was over 3,000 people out there, all families, you know, and even the people next to us with their chi their children, you know, got got injured and hurt, and it's just, you know, it should be should have been a lot, lot safer. Three people died in that crash: two children and one woman. Attorneys for the victims say the families are hoping this lawsuit will help them figure out what went wrong and make sure something like this never happens again. The fight over COVID-19 vaccine mandates heating up among police and firefighters. In New York City, there are suspicions of an anti-vaccine mandate tactic after more than 2,000 firefighters called out sick. Their union denies that. Isabel Rosales breaks down the headbutting on the vaccines coast to coast. Escalating tensions over COVID-19 vaccine mandates. We're uh, pro-vaccine, we're just anti-mandate. In New York City, a spike of sick callouts. About 2,300 firefighters out since the vaccine mandate went into effect Monday. Mayor Bill de Blasio warns there will be consequences. The folks who are faking it are doing an immense disservice to the people of the city and to their fellow members of service. The city now investigating whether the firefighters union coordinated a protest sick out. The assertion that thousands of firefighters are faking on medical leave. We reject the staffing issues in this city are not germane to medical leave. Despite the battle over mandates, de Blasio says they work. In the last 13 days, 24,000 more city workers got the shot. About 92% of city employees have received at least one dose. So far, less than 3% of the city's workforce is on unpaid leave for refusing to comply. 
The mayor insists New Yorkers remain safe with no service disruption. Los Angeles County Sheriff refusing to enforce a vaccine mandate on county employees, including his deputies. We have to provide public safety, and right now I'm severely understaffed as it is. To throw this on top of that, you're really tempting the hand of fate. In Washington, Isabel Rosales. Pleasant outside today. Some what I call pancake cumulus clouds flat on the bottom, flat on top. 62 this morning by the afternoon. This hasn't updated yet. The high temperature we have made it into the upper 70s, even some lower 80s along the Rio Grande Del Rio Eagle Pass. 81 degrees Floresville right now at 80. You get to 76 in Boulevard, 78 Canyon Lake and 77 in Windcrest this evening. Nothing to worry about. Pleasant a hint of humidity in the air with a dew point around 60. We will see some increasing clouds overnight and some drizzle developing through the night and especially toward dawn tomorrow. Big changes happening throughout the day tomorrow and get ready for some rain. I'm going to tell you how much cooler and time out the rain in just a bit. All right, Adam, looking at some uh, slow traffic here on the east side. This is at 35 and loop 410 tra traffic heading northbound, uh, pretty much crawling there as we take a look, a closer look at the travel time in that area. And let's take a look at that uh, right there. This is between 35 and uh, 410 and downtown. Uh, 21 minutes uh, heading northbound, 18 minutes heading outbound, and then the normal uh, 10 to 12 minutes uh, on the other side. Seeing some uh, delays on 151, 15 minutes now between 410 and Loop 1604 heading westbound. Also, finally, up in the Bernie area, did see a major delay there on I-10 at, say, Highway 46. That, in the past few minutes, has cleared. See? Thank you, Samuel. New at five, driving while pregnant. Seatbelts save thousands of lives every year, so it may surprise you to learn that seatbelts can contribute to fetal injury when pregnant women are in a crash. 12 Near Sides' Marilyn Moritz with safety steps to protect mom and baby. Remember those buckle up campaigns? Those two crash test dummies were named Vince and Larry. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Vehicles and restraint systems are designed for average sized men. That potentially leaves small women, the elderly and children more vulnerable in a crash and it's bad for pregnant people. To address that risk for pregnant women, some companies sell seat belt adjusters or positioners, devices that attach to the lap portion of the belt and anchor between the legs away from the abdomen. But do they help? The problem with these seat belt adjusters is that the government does not set any standards for these devices and they do not regulate them. So experts still believe that the three-point seatbelt is a pregnant person's best bet and that any modifications to the car's safety restraint system can be problematic. Safety experts say your car's seatbelt is best if you wear it correctly. Adjust the seat to have as much distance as possible between the belly and steering wheel. Adjust the steering wheel so you can reach it and the pedals. Then adjust the shoulder belt height and position the lap snugly across the hips and pelvic bone. Don't put the lap belt over the belly. It should go underneath to protect the fetus in a crash. As for the airbags, you should never disable them. And if you're a pregnant passenger, just scoot your seat back as far as you can. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. 5G, it's supposed to be faster than ever before, but it's causing concerns for pilots. The warning the FAA has given and how it could apply to you. Plus, the White House has new plans to prevent suicide among our nation's military. We're going to take a look at how they hope to tackle it next. The Department of Justice now working on a plan on a suicide prevention project. It's focused on active military and veterans. The plan laid out today involving re involves requiring firearm dealers to promote safe gun storage and make secure storage and safety devices available for purchase. A guide on best practices would also be issued to all federal firearm dealers. President Biden also pushing Congress to pass a national red flag law and getting those at high risk of suicide to voluntarily limit their access to things they could use for harm. You're supposed to switch your phones to airplane mode while flying, and now the FAA is asking pilots to remind passengers 
about that even more. They say 5G cell phone service, which rolls out in 46 markets across the country next month, can interfere with navigation equipment, particularly something called an altimeter. It tells pilots how high an aircraft is by bouncing radio waves off the ground. The FAA says 5G service operates on the same system and could cause the altimeters to malfunction or be unreliable. Time now to take a look at what's ahead on the news at six. Myra Arthur joins us live to talk about what's coming up in less than an hour. Myra. Ursula, you know, still a lot of questions about that drag racing crash in Kerrville that killed three people. We talked about that lawsuit filed earlier in this show, hearing from one of the surviving victims as well. We know there were no barricades placed along the Kerrville Airport runway, the section where those cars lost control plowing into the crowd. Well, today at six, we're taking a look at what safety protocols are in place, typically at similar style events. Plus, today is the biggest celebration for Day of the Dead. We're talking to a woman who is celebrating her first Dia de los Muertos at a local cemetery in honor of her husband who died this summer. One of the most beautiful parts of this story is that she is using this holiday as a way to help her four year old son remember his late father. Alicia Barrera shares that story all coming up today at six o'clock. Guys. Thank you, Myra. Take a live look outside with live cam right now. We are pushing 80 degrees and is a cold front still pushing our way out of uh, Yes, and by this time tomorrow, we'll be pushing 60 degrees. So get ready wow. for a big change on the way. Actually, several changes to talk about. So let's get right to it, not waste any time. Becoming cooler throughout the day tomorrow. It's going to be warmer in the morning than it will be in the afternoon. Keep that in mind. So when you go out to the bus stop in the morning with your umbrella and it's in the 60s, that's warmer than when the kids get off the bus later in the day. So at least have a sweatshirt or jacket ready to go in the backpack. Intermittent rain tomorrow all the way through Wednesday morning. Sometimes it'll be drizzle. Sometimes we'll have a few cracks of uh, thunder and of course lightning out there. And then we'll see the rain come to an end as we progress through Thursday. Jacket weather all day Thursday. And by the way, we will see a beautiful uh, weekend on the way. So let's get right to it. First of all, Right now, we're right up near 80, 79 degrees, dew point is 60. So a bit of a breeze in the air uh, with that southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. That's giving us that hint of humidity that we have. It's not oppressive, but you notice it a little bit compared to what we had over the weekend and late last week. We have a lot of sunshine overhead, just the puffy, patchy, fair weather cumulus clouds and temperatures with our sunshine, 70s to 80s, 85 in Pleasanton, 81 New Braunfels, 87 Catula, 84 Carrizo Springs, but let's go behind the cold front. We're still on the warm side of it here. Let's go to the cooler side of the cold front, and there you have it. Midland, Abilene, Lubbock, Amarillo, Oklahoma City, all in the 40s at this hour. There's that front junction. It is right on your doorstep. It's through Sonora, just not quite through junction. Junction still at 72 degrees, but this front is slowly pushing its way southward. And of course, it's going to have a big impact on our temperatures tomorrow. For the first part of the day, we'll be in the 60s. But then by the afternoon, these are afternoon temperatures when we would typically hit our high, we'll be in the 50s. Thursday, we'll spend pretty much all day in the 40s and 50s. By Friday, we rebound a little bit back into the 60s, and I mentioned the weekend looking beautiful uh, with temperatures into the 70s and a lot of sunshine. So the activity is coming tonight through tomorrow and lasting through Thursday. Here's the big picture. There's a lot of cloud cover. We talked about that behind this front. That cloud cover is going to be stuck overhead here throughout the day tomorrow and all of Thursday. A little bit of shower activity, of course, behind this front, and we'll be tapping into some of that moisture as well. Even a little bit of snow up there farther to the north in the plains, Colorado and Nebraska. However, or into Kansas, I should say. Around here, I'm going to show you the future cast. This is 5 a.m. I expect drizzle and some areas of sprinkles. As we progress through the day, 10 a.m. through the early afternoon, some rumbles of thunder, a little bit of lightning, some heavier downpours mixed in. Don't pay too close attention to the location of these showers and storms. Just the mere 
presence of them and the fact that we're anticipating intermittent or off and on showers and thunderstorms throughout the day tomorrow. As I said before, at times it'll be drizzle, other times will be low clouds. Wait another hour or two and you could have a heavy downpour go by. All in all, we could see around an inch up and down I-35 in and around Bear County and surrounding communities as well. New Braunfels to Divine all the way up to Bernie. We could have about an inch of rain east of town, slightly higher accumulations. This is important. Take a look at your screen here. 66 in the morning and near the noon hour by the afternoon. We're in the 50s with the gusty north wind at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Thursday, 40s and 50s all day. Then we're sunny and rebounding temperature wise through the weekend. Oh, that is chilly. Thank you. Mm. All right. I was surprised how bad the Spurs played last. Yes, night. and Pop did not mince any words about what he thought of his team's performance, calling it the worst game of the season. When we come back, we'll show you what happened in Indiana and also how Micah Parson prepared differently for the win in Minnesota when we come back. Our San Antonio Spurs had a chance to put together their first win streak of the season, coming off the defeat of the defending NBA champions on Saturday night. Instead, they delivered a lackluster performance in Indiana against the Pacers, who had been struggling to start their season, leading only once in this game at 11 to 10. Their defense was non-existent, allowing to be outscored 43-33 in the first quarter alone, and then in the first half, 78 to 56. Spurs head coach Greg Popovich calling it our worst game of the year. Dejounte Murray led the Spurs with 16 points, right behind him, Devin Vassell with 15. One of eight Spurs in double figures, but the Pacers were led by DeMontis Sabonis with 24 points, 13 rebounds. One of their six players in double figures and made 18 three-pointers on the night in the 131-118 blowout. They just came out more desperate, more want. And, I mean, it's unacceptable how we started in our effort. So, um, top to bottom, we just got to be better. And, um, and that starts with me. And um, I'm just got, I just got to come ready to go. For some reason, we just we didn't come out ready tonight. Um, they're playing very well. We've got to give them credit, but we just we didn't bring the, the intensity. Back at home tomorrow against the Dallas Mavericks, 7:30. We'll be there live starting at five. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Certainly, a lot of the credit for the Cowboys' victory on Sunday against the Vikings in Minnesota has to go to backup quarterback Cooper Rush, who threw two second-half touchdowns to lift the Cowboys to a 20 to 16 victory. But the Dallas D also provided a lot of backup for Cooper in his first NFL start, allowing only one touchdown in the first quarter, and then denying the Vikings another trip to the end zone for the rest of the game. First draft pick Micah Parsons was a beast on defense. He had 11 tackles, 10 solo, four tackles for a loss, and told us after the game he prepared differently this past week. The indication that Dak Prescott would not be able to go and that the Cowboys would need more from their defense to win. You know, I just felt like, you know, this is probably one of my better games I played. And uh, like I said during the week, when things are going right, you got to prepare different. So I think this week it came in mindset like uh, Sunday night, got to be the it factor. So I think uh, it's kind of like what I expected, what I wanted to do today. All right, the Cowboys will go after their seventh win in a row against the Denver Broncos on Sunday at noon in AT&T Stadium after the Broncos traded linebacker Von Miller to the Rams. And coming up at 6 o'clock, we'll hear from the players for the first time since UTSA head coach Jeff Trader signed his new 10-year extension. I'm guessing they're excited about that. They're very happy, but they, they tell us they were a little nervous, too, when they uh, saw the athletic director in the team meeting. I bet. Thanks, mm -hmm. Greg. Sure. We'll be right back.